8255 is the number to call. That's 521-8255. Here's James in Ottawa. What do you think, James? Well, I just want to, you brought up a point earlier. You were hypothesizing about uh, what would happen if the Islamic State actually were to grow to the point where it became that problematic. And I just wanted to call in because I want you to know it's much more likely than not. And uh, if anybody's uncertain about the likelihood of it, there's a site called the Long War Journal, which has a 2005 article called The Seven Phases of the Base. Of course, the base is English for Al-Qaeda, right? Okay, the Long Word... Longwordjournal.org. Okay, is it W-O-R-D or R-A-R-D? It's actually Long Word, Whiskey, Alpha, Romeo. So Long, long Word. Word, the Long Word Journal. Not, okay. not Word, War is in War. War, the Long War Journal. Yes, long okay, like you've World sent War it to me here, and, and, and yeah. what I'll do is I'll tweet it out for our listeners here, uh, James, okay. because you're one of those guys that I trust just about everything you send me. And uh, okay. uh, I've already previewed it a little bit but, you know, when you sent it to me about a half hour ago. But, uh, folks, what he's talking about will be up on, uh, on, on Twitter and on the Late Night Council, Council Facebook page before we go off air tonight at 11 o'clock. Continue, James. Okay, so this document has been fully vetted, and as a matter of fact, Major Stephen Coughlin, who, who for many years briefed the Joint Chiefs of Staff on these matters, uh, has vetted this document and is briefed on this document. Okay, so this is this is fully, you know, like it's verifiable. Uh, it's it was done by a journalist in 1982 from interviews with Al Zarqawi, among others. Now, the first five phases I won't go through you because I haven't got time. But the first four phases I won't go through. The fifth one. No, remember, this was written in 1982, this document. The fifth phase will be the point at which the Islamic State or Caliphate can be declared. The plans by that time, between 2013 and 2016, oh, that works out well, Western influence in the Islamic world will be so reduced and Israel weakened so much that resistance will not be feared. Al-Qaeda hopes that by then the Islamic State will be able to bring about a new world order. Now, if people don't believe it was written in 1982, it doesn't matter because you can see it was published in 2005. So that's quite, it's like nine years ago, right? The sixth phase is uh, a period of total confrontation. So this is going to be open. So you're warfare. saying that you're saying that the first five save, first five phases are already been completed. Yes, it, exactly as predicted and has been planned. See, it's exactly, yeah, it's, it's, it's happened exactly as they planned to do it because they've been working on this for a long time. Muslim Brotherhood is an organization that's been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. And they've been working. They've they've been working off the milestones process, which is a book by Said Cut up. I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a degree program to go into all this stuff, right? But what, the point I'm trying to make is that you can look around at some fairly obvious things like this document and see that one out of five has, has been accomplished out of a seven point plan, right? Five, so five out of seven have been accomplished. Five, sorry, yes, five out, five out of seven has been accomplished already. Six is total open warfare, pretty much everywhere. Uh, that's by what 2016. And uh, seven phases definitive victory, according to them. So, you know, of course, it doesn't have to work out that way. These aren't biblical prophecies. Even biblical prophecies don't have to work out But that it's way. an exposing of their calculated plan of what they're engaging in right now. Yes. So if we don't take it seriously and, be, you know, drop political correctness and start to address the threat for what it is and start looking at the nature, you know, Islam is the is the overarching principle upon which all these things are done and it's a very alien system to us it's not really a religion as we understand it and it's uh, an ideology you can see that if you saw ezra's piece yesterday about how muslims in, in ottawa school boards are demanding well, it's that essex be, county school board yes okay and are but are asking to not be not participate in uh and uh, Armistice Day and so on, it's obvious that there's a different ideology at work and a different set of plans at work, and we're going to have to recognize this, and there's consequences to these things. We're going to have to start speaking openly about it, and we're going to have to take back the power to criticize authority, religious or political, which we seem to have given up in the name of what political correctness and politeness. Now, folks, that article is up on Twitter now, and if you go to the Late Night Council Facebook page, you can read it at your leisure. And uh, the article that James is talking about there, it's already up there. We tweeted, I tweeted up while you were talking there, uh, James. So I was saying it's, it's, it's more likely than not that we're going to see that level of confrontation. In terms of evil as the Nazis, I've got to tell you, at least Hitler liked music and he liked dogs. If Iran just passed a, a law yesterday saying that anyone caught with a dog will get 72 lashes because Koran says... Yeah, dogs are dogs unclean will, animals, yeah. And that an angel won't visit a house with a dog or a picture in it and that the devil will come as a black dog or something. Uh, you know, the fact is that we're already starting to see suspicious poisonings of dogs in Toronto and, you know, near mosques and so on. Even in Ottawa, I believe, there's been some suspicious... All of a sudden, this poisoned meat's been left around in parks that are 
curiously close to Moss. But you're going to see that the, the, the restrictions that are going to be slowly applied to non-Muslims are going to be, you know, like we're going to, the Nazis were all, at least, like, I'm, not, I'm no fan of the Nazis, but at least they liked art, they liked music, they liked dogs. But there was a, we had more in common. Anyway. Thanks for your call, James. Thank you. 5218255 is the number to call. That's 5218255, star 580 on the Bell Mobility System. 1-800-580-2372 is the long distance line. We're right back after this. Stay with us. CFRA. The callers are screened. The host is not. You've been warned. This is Late Night Council on 580 CFRA. Hassan, you're on the air. Hi, John. How are you? Today? Hi. Been quite a day. Right, Terif- right. Terrific calls today. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, John, I just wanted to make a comment earlier uh, in, the, uh, in the show. Uh, you mentioned Iran was encouraging ISIS. I thought, uh, John, Iran was uh, with us against uh, ISIS. Mm, no, they were asked to, go, to draw in, and they were asked to join the coalition against them, and they refused to. Oh, oh they're not helping uh, no, not at the, all. the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi military? Not at all, unless there's, been, unless there's been a development in the last 24 to 48 hours that I haven't heard of. Uh, they oh. were asked to join that coalition before it came together, and they upright, outright refused. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, another comment, uh, just uh, the last, uh, your last uh, uh, visitor, he was mentioning about uh, uh, some ridiculous uh, comments about dogs being killed around mosques. Uh, as a Muslim, uh, John, I can assure you that uh, there is a, a, a hadith or a, or a saying in the Quran that who Allah or God hates people who hurt uh, dogs have you got there a dog no, for me have you got a pet I dog ha- I, I don't have a dog but i play with my uh, the dogs of my neighbors all the okay, time n- now do you know, do you have any uh, do you have any like uh, muslim friends of yours that, that own dogs yeah i know i know some guy who lives about a few blocks from me he has uh, he has a dog how common is it for muslims to own dogs it, it's it, it's it's uh, to be honest with you, I'm not. I haven't visited a lot of places or a lot of countries, but in the in the, for example, places uh, in the nomadic uh, people in uh, Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf states, not the cities. I've seen them uh, herding. They use dogs to help them with their herds, okay. like with their goats or whatever in the desert. Because uh, you so, know, you know, the Quran has a very low view of dogs, though. Uh, it it uh, from from my knowledge, when the dog is uh, somebody told me when the dog is wet, that's the only rejection or only time they say that don't touch it. Well, I don't want dog my dog, dog around when it's wet either, because when it's wet comes yeah. in the house, it shakes all over the place. It's ridiculous. I, I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 they 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 use dogs in the desert, like they use it for their okay. own good, like to to herd uh, goats or sheep or whatever. Yeah, and and it's ridiculous that. Uh, well, what he talked saying, what he talked about was there's been sus- some suspicious dog yeah, poisonings. But, he, but he's telling you know? me, uh, t- saying around mosques, like he's insinuating that. Uh, okay, well, that I mean, he's got he's, he's got he's got a he's it's it's his responsibility pr- to produce the evidence and the sources for you know yeah, yeah, what's going yeah, on here. Be, and and yeah, when I well, when I see that, that's going to be much more credible, isn't it? Yeah, when 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 he has evidence, yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, he shouldn't. Yeah. I, pu- I put that. I put Muslim, that. I've seen. I've seen a uh, sheikh. I, I actually I heard a uh, uh, a Muslim uh, sheikh in Arawa saying, uh, "Whoever hurts dogs, uh, Allah hates them more." Like that's Allah makes the, uh, Allah gets angry when he sees somebody hurting dogs. That's how uh, uh, the Quran uh, say good things about dogs. Thanks, Hassan. So, yeah, now, that you. wasn't a Quran, though. That was a sheikh saying that. 
Well, the sheep, according to the Quran or the Hadith, uh, you know, okay, uh, he's well, not well, saying from if, if you could find that scripture from the Quran that says if you hurt dogs, you're in trouble. Hadith. Yeah, yeah. Huh? If you could find that, send it to me, Hassan. Okay. Okay. I'll okay. Do that. Good having yeah. you on. Thanks for calling yeah. in. Last night, of course, it was open line, open topic, and somebody called in about Muslims not liking dogs and how there have been rumors and reports of dogs being poisoned in close proximity to Toronto mosques. And uh, somebody questioned the validity of those, uh, uh, those stories, and I had the actual stories emailed to me today, so they are real, they are authentic, and I can tweet them up on the, on the Twitterverse uh, momentarily. And I also had a Muslim call in tonight, last night, and they said that, uh, oh, no, 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 uh, like our, our uh, imam said that if you, if you hurt dogs or you, you know, that, that you, you don't go to heaven. That's what the, um, the caller said last night. And I knew the next night was Ask the Pastor, so I thought, you know, I've got to do some research in this, and I want to thank Cynthia for sending me some stuff. And uh, she is quoting a number of Sunni hadiths, okay, which is the, you know, the tradition of Sunni tradition. And she's got some uh, quotes from the Shiite tradition as well. Now, Sunni and Shiite are the two largest branches of Islam in the world, okay? And she gave me a lot of material, but I will quote some of them, okay, from the Sunni hadiths here, from Bukhari, volume 4, number 540. And I'm quoting, Allah's apostle ordered that the dog should be killed. Abu Dawood, book 16, number 2839. Were dogs not a species of creature, I should command that they all be killed, but kill every pure black one. The Hadith note says, the prophet did not order the killing of all dogs, but some are to be trained, re- retained for hunting and watching. He ordered to kill the jet black ones. They might be more mischievous among them. And then in Muslim book 024, number 5246, this is from the Sunni Hadiths here. It quotes an encounter between Gabriel and Muhammad here. It says, then Gabriel came and Allah's messenger said to him, you promised me and I waited for you, but you did not come. Whereupon he, Gabriel, said it was the dog in your house which prevented me to come. For we angels do not enter a house in which there is a dog or a picture. Then in Muslim book 024, number 5248, I'm quoting again, Then on the very morning he commanded the killing of the dogs until he announced that the dog kept for the orchard should also be killed, but he spared the dog bed for the protection of extensive fields or big gardens. In Malik's Mawada, book 54, number 54.5.13, Malik related from Nafi, from Abdullah ibn Umar, that the messenger of God ordered all dogs other than sheep dogs or hunting dogs to be killed. Then one more from the Sunni tradition, from Bukhari, volume 1, number 490. This is Aisha narrating here. The things which annul the prayers were mentioned before me. They said, prayer is annulled by a dog, a donkey, and a woman, if they pass in front of the praying people. In other words, your prayers are annulled if a dog passes in front of you while you're praying. Now, those are all from the Sunni tradition. Now, this is from the Shiite tradition. Iraq's Ayatollah Sistani, okay, the following ten things are essential najis, which are unclean. Urine, feces, semen, dead body, blood, dogs, pigs, or kafirs. That's an unbeliever, non-Muslims. And alcoholic liquors or the sweat of an animal who persistently eats najasat, which is unclean things. So pretty strong evidence from the Hadith that dogs are unclean. And Muhammad had ordered the killing of all of them especially black ones, because they were thought to be demonic. Now, you could keep a few, you know, for guard dogs or doing shepherd work, but as far as, and this has increased, too, as, as more Muslims have moved into, you know, larger cities, you see a dimmer, dimmer view of dogs. At least that's what the Hadiths are teaching. 521-8255 is number to call. This is not the Quran now, this is Hadith, the Hadiths, the traditions. Not what they believe to be the Word of God, which is uh, the Quran. Welcome back. 521-8255 is the number to call. That's 521-8255. Here's Dana. Hi, Dana. Yeah, hi. How are you? I'm wonderful, Dana. What's on your mind? Um, I just wanted to comment on your on your view about uh, that 
Muslims supposedly hate dogs and with the hadith, I don't I don't have a view on it, Dana. I'm I'm just quoting from a, a Sunni hadiths here, yeah. and I'm quoting from a, a Shiite imam in in Iraq. Yeah. So about these, I just had a question about your Sunni hadiths. Are they um, there's there's specific uh, type of hadiths that uh, usually you're supposed to reference to make sure that you uh, uh, you prove your argument right. There's two types. There's authentic hadiths, which are called sahih, and there's another which are weak. So yeah, these these are these are authentic hadiths. Okay, so the authentic hadiths. So one question, and I just want to say that the most biggest uh, evidence showing that we don't we don't like we don't kill dogs, that we don't mistreat dogs, is that there's a chapter. Dana, in- I never said Muslims kill dogs. There's been reports in Toronto. Yeah. Okay, of of of, of you know uh, poison dogs within close proximity to mosques. Mm-hmm. That that yeah. says that doesn't mean that Muslims are killing dogs. Okay, yeah. now whoever published that article, you know, and it's it's it, you know it, it's a credible right. periodical. That, you know, that's why this topic has come up. We're talking about it here. I haven't yeah. taken a position on this at all. I'm just you know yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 quoting stuff that's uh, you know sent to me, and I mean I won't quote it unless I've checked it out to make sure it's authoritative, yeah. though. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that the biggest evidence to show that um, it could, this article could be biased just to kind of target um, Muslims in a way. Yeah, but, but I haven't Muslims quoted that article, Dana. That. I have not but, quoted that article for that reason right there. You're right, it could no. be biased. But I have quoted from these authentic hadiths, yeah. and I mentioned you know uh, which ones they were and the references, yeah. and there is quite a tradition of very anti-dog within the Sunni yeah. tradition of Islam. But one thing, when you look back back in the day, a lot of people were very strict with things, right? Now people are more we're more civil, like we're more civilized, and people now it depends on the time. And if you look nowadays, I know many Muslims, including myself. I actually think dogs are very cute, but for us, are like if I've. I've went through the wisdom and I've talked to many, uh, many sheikhs about this that uh, have done degrees, undergraduate degrees, and, and they're very, very like intellectual, knowledgeable. That they said the, only, the, the wisdom behind us not having dogs and that they, um, they are um, quote unquote unclean, I guess. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, just... that um, it me basically when we, when we put dogs in the houses, they they somewhat kind of get depressed, and there's many cases of uh, dogs being. They don't get to, oh now and, now now Dan, I gotta disagree with you there. I've had dogs all my life. Don't tell me they I get know. depressed, no. okay? I mean, I've had dogs but in the I'm house, saying, and they're the happiest little things in the world. Yes, yes. What I'm saying is that when you, in an instance for for wild dogs, they are wild. They don't like to be in houses. Back in the day, all the dogs were wild, so. These hadiths are based on that these well, dogs. No, 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 no. no. The, the sheep dogs and the guard dogs weren't wild. They were, they were, they were work dogs. They were, they were, they were tame. Dogs, but they were originally wild. No. no, they weren't wild while you, while you know, shepherds and and people were using them back in the day. They weren't yeah. wild at all. They were fully domesticated. Okay. Well, the only one, the one thing I wanted to get to the point in the one last point is that in the Quran, in the chapter of the cave. Um, the 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 people that were in the cave they were guarded by a dog and they had a dog with them at all times if they if 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 this was even before the time of the prophet so that it, even even then if if you think of it then that means Muslims don't hate dogs or uh, people that with a, well with then why did Muhammad thinking, why did the why did Muhammad order the killing of of dogs in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the, not the killing of dogs <laughs> if just to prove that there is a he said there's an authentic hadith saying there was a woman she uh, mistreated the dog she went to hell. There was another woman. She well, she I'm looking. At, I'm looking at from the authentic dog, and she went to heaven. I'm looking at the. I'm looking at. I'm looking at the authentic Sunni hadith here, and it's it's under Muslim number three eight one four Ibn Mugahafal reporting it here. Yeah. Allah's mm-hmm. Allah's messenger ordered the killing of dogs, and then said, "What is the trouble with them? The people of Medina, how dogs are nuisances to them." In what book was them. this? In what book was this? This is this is Muslim n- number three eight one four, and it's even Ibn, Ibn Mugahafal reporting it on it. Okay, well, uh, most, uh, just to just to say that Muslim, not all of the uh, uh, in the uh, in book of Muslim, not all of the hadiths are sahih. In all in Bukhari, all of them are authentic. So if you find this hadith in Bukhari, okay, I'm looking at Bukhari. I'm looking at Bukhari, volume four, number five forty. 
Alice okay. Apostle ordered that the dog should be killed. Okay, that's a quote right from Bakari, Volume 4, number 540. Maybe it, the, maybe the very hadith that you just mentioned is authentic. Okay, well, do you see the hadith about the woman that she fed the dog and gave him water and went to heaven? You should look at that hadith. It, it will well, I, 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 I'm, not questioning, I'm, not, I'm not questioning that at all, Dana, but you know, a, a, woman feeding a, dog and going to, a woman feeding a dog and going to heaven, does that balance out uh, uh, your, your prophet ordering uh, dogs to be killed? I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking, Dana. It shows. It shows that in uh, okay, like okay, what if if, the, if Allah's apostle were uh, ordered all dogs to be killed? Why would this woman that helped a dog went to heaven? That doesn't well, make that, sense. Well, that's that's your question to answer, not mine. I'm just I'm well, just know, I'm mean, just I'm just reporting logic, what I'm seeing here. If you use logic, then then then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand the logic of a woman feeding a dog and going to heaven, and yet, you know, it, it, you know, so it, it, that, it being okay to so order a that. bunch of dogs to be killed. I don't see the logic in that at all. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. But that's just my opinion. That. I'm sure, I'm sure that the opinion that uh, that that dogs were poisoned near the mosque was very biased. And it's just, it's, it's very, um, it's kind well, of Well, if it's, if, it, if it's biased, if it's biased and there's dogs that have been found within the, uh, the, yeah. the vicinity of the mosque and it's not true, you know, then that's slander and libel. But I don't hear anybody, you know, uh, accusing the authors of the article, uh, you know, for, for slander or libel. Anyway, Dan, you know, I, I, appreci- I appreciate you calling in. The, you know what? The, the la- I've got other people that want to address this, and I've got to go to the okay. news here, and I'm up against the clock, so I'm going to let you go, and I, and I appreciate you calling in, okay? 521 right. 855 is the number to call. That's 521 855. Star 580 on Bell Mobility. 1 800 580 2372 is the long distance line. Let's ask the pastor on late night council tonight. Open line, open topic. I'm trying to give it a biblical perspective, but there was a question about, you know, the. Uh, Quranic and the and the Islamic perspective. So I'm doing my best here, okay? If you're on hold, you're getting on the air. Stay with us. This is Ask the Pastor on Late Night Council, 580 CFRA. Welcome back. I am I am pleased to announce that at 945, I told you uh, we had not confirmed our guest tonight, but we have now, and Dr. Andy Bannister is going to be joining us in the next segment. Dr. Andy Bannister has a Ph.D. in Islamic Studies. His latest book is called An Oral Formulaic Study of the Quran, and he's one of the five theologians that are flying in from all over uh, the world, really, literally, uh, for Dig and Delve, which is a a conference on thought and digging and delving into uh, some of the deeper questions of life at the Ottawa Little Theater. And if you want to register for it, it starts Friday night and goes all day Saturday, uh, digandelve.ca. Digandelve.ca. I mean, it's worth going to that website just to see some of the topics these guys are talking about on uh, 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 on Friday night and uh, all day Saturday as well. And there's still room for you to register. The place seats 400. It's filling up fast. And I think they will take walk-ons as well. It starts at 7 o'clock at the Ottawa Little Theater Friday night and uh, and then goes from 8.30 in the morning on Saturday, I think, till 4.30 or 5.00. And uh, one of the speakers, Andy Bannister, is going to be uh, joining us um, at about 9.45. I hope, I think we're going to have him for a half hour. In the meantime, in the meantime, we're going to go to Cynthia in Montreal. Hi, Cynthia. Hi there. So what do you think about this discussion here? Well, what I'd like to say is that uh, the previous caller was mentioning how Muslims are more civilized now regarding dogs. I guess she was referring to dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to know um, if if they're so civilized right now, why are they using why will they not use guide dogs, but instead they're using guide horses? It seems like they're so reviled by dogs that... Hold on now. Hold on now. The Muslims don't use guide dogs? Blind no. Muslims don't use guide dogs? They cannot. They are not allowed to use dogs because dogs are unclean. So they use ponies, uh, guide ponies. Guide ponies. And they bring them onto buses. They bring them into their homes. And this... Have you actually seen a guide pony? I've seen them in the newspaper. I've uh, I read the newspapers and I see pictures and I see stories about it and it's it's all over the news. <laughs> where 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 are guide ponies actually in use in North America anywhere? Where the where the newspaper said? Well, I, mean. I know I remember reading this uh, from a um, a UK paper. 
Uh, the person's name was Mona Ramuni. Okay, a much higher Muslim population in Britain than there is in in Canada, so, okay. Uh, in the States, it's possible that uh, they might be also using them in the States as well. I wouldn't be surprised because I know that um, religious Muslims are very much against having dogs in their home. Okay, because they're an unclean animal. Exactly. According to Islamic tradition. That's now, fine, they're allowed now, to believe that. I mean, no. And also, um, religious-wise, uh, we read this in the Hadith, but if, if you go to Reliance of the Traveler, which is um, it's the, the, uh, one of the most venerated legal documents in Sunni law, if you go there, they talk about the dog as well, uh, that filth means, and they give different uh, definitions for filth, one of which is dogs, and this is in their legal document. So they consider it an unclean animal. Yes. Just like uh, Jewish uh, Old Testament law considers pigs an unclean animal, considers, you know, shellfish unclean animals, considers uh, uh, birds of prey to be unclean a- animals. You know, but you can uh, still have them as pets. Uh, yeah, there's, no, there's nothing outlawing and, uh, any of those. You, and, well, I don't know. I've never met a Jew that had a pet pig, though, Cynthia. I mean, <laughs> you know. Well, but, you're, but you're not allowed to kill them. In, in different religions, they might be unclean, but there's no law to say that they have to be killed. Now, is there an Islamic... And they don't go out of their way to kill them. I mean, their horses are, are, you, not, are, are, are not clean. Are, are, are you suggesting that the, 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 in the Hadith there is... A, I didn't see in the, in the, you know, the, the Hadith uh, uh, writings uh, that were sent to me, I didn't see anything that was a, there was a command to kill them. They're just considered unclean unless they're... No, je- they're, they're it, the, it says that Allah's Apostle ordered that the dogs should be killed. Okay. It's an order that they be killed. So... And that's in that's from uh, Bukhari. That's from the. It's the, not. The, the, it's 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 in many. Uh, it's in it's in the uh, authentic hadith. It's in Sahih Muslim as well. Allah's messenger ordered the killing of dogs. That's what it says exactly. So more than just a, a dog being unclean, there's right. a, there's a command to kill them. Right. Wow. That's it. Wow. Yes. Yes, okay, and it's very so sad because just one other point I'd like to make. Now, now, seen... now, I'm sure I'm going to have you know Muslims calling up tonight saying, "No, no, no, that's not true. She's got it all wrong." You know, how am I supposed to respond to that? Well, because I'm just quoting the hadith. Okay, okay. And these are authentic hadiths. Okay, they're, they're not well, the weak ones. Is it possible that they have a different translation or interpretation of no, those hadiths? Absolutely not. No. Okay. No. <laughs> okay, Cynthia. Thank you. Well, I know we got the Doctor of Islamic Studies calling in, you know, 945, and not because of this topic. This was just, this came up on my show last night, and, you know, I didn't feel like I was very, you know, uh, authoritative in dealing with it, and I had a number of callers, you know, going back and forth disagreeing, so I wanted to do some research on my own. So uh, thank you for your input, Cynthia. Appreciate it. Thank you. Five two, five two one uh, five two one eight two five five is the number to call. Uh, Mirwes, Mirwes in, in, in Ottawa. You're on the air, Mirwes? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hello, how are you doing? How am nice I doing? I don't know. Tell me how I'm doing. I'm doing my best, I can tell you that. <laughs> I know, I, I, I'm glad to, to hear that. Uh, my opinion, and I'm, um, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that I'm a Muslim, and uh, um, it's to my knowledge, what uh, our uh, our friend, she was talking now about the Hadith, she, she has just quoted one Hadith, and there are more than 5,000 Hadith. Well, yeah, I know, I know, but but I but but I've seen I've seen just tonight I've seen at least a dozen that no, strongly no, coming, su- that, that strongly to, suggest that what she's point. saying is right is true. I'm coming to the point. Yeah, there, there is no doubt about that hadith, and that's the authentic hadith. But uh, I'm saying I'm saying something else. Uh, there was a disease about the cows in North America, and. Can you tell me how many cows were killed at that time? Oh, in England, they killed, they slaughtered uh, thousands of them. Not thousand, even hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm, be- I'm be- be- because that, of because that of mad. Now, but hold on here, Mirway. To use that yeah. as an example, that was because of mad cow disease. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 and our our team, dog- at that time when uh, that uh, the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he he ordered to kill the dogs or take them out of the city. It was just because they had a disease at that time. I've never se- I've me, never I've never seen a reference in a hadith that no, said no, that it, they were diseased. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that if there is not a reference or there, there should be a doctors at that time to give the reference about the disease but it was the messenger of god he got the the the, the message from god that these so 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 why time. why is there no record in the hadith of these yeah. dogs being diseased then if what you're no, saying is that true was, that if you go uh, if you go to the explanation of the hadith it says can you tell me after that time after just that particular time if of the, and in any Islamic city, in Islamic countries, if any uh, anyone have killed dozens of dogs, 
Can, can what, anyone explain that? What was your question again, Maria? I, I missed that. I said after that, only that one time, after that one time, in that small area, when there was a Medina, was a small place with small quantity of the dogs. After that, can anyone prove that well, the, well, then any why, Islamic well, country, can, uh, can anyone prove that in uh, the whole history of 1,400 years, well, can I, the, anyone the, prove Mir, that Mir, Mir, wait, this is, have killed any dogs? Mirway, this is not my argument here. I'm just asking questions here. Now, yeah. we had the, the previous caller uh, uh, say that Muslims don't use guide dogs. Is that true? No, no, no. That's not true. That's not true. I, I will, I, if, you, if you give me a time, I will prove that the Muslims are using the guide dogs. Because, uh, and I'm telling you that dog has been used, the name of the dog has been used in Quran several times. Mm-hmm. Several times. Uh, it, and also the Quran, the, the Quran ordered the Muslims to keep the dogs for the hunt. And if yeah, dog, I know, I know. I've quoted uh, those. I've quoted those scriptures from the Hadith. I've quoted those as well. No, as, no, as, as, not well from the hadith. as as this well as from the Hadith. This is from the Quran. Our, our God says, if your dog, which you have already taught him how to uh, to uh, to catch the, the kill for you. Well, I'm, he, yeah, but he, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the same thing in the Hadith from Bukhari and from Abu Duawud as well. Is you know to, yeah. to 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 retain the hunting and and the watching dogs, but to, but to kill the rest of them. No, no, never, never. It, Do you want it, me to read it to you, Mirwaz? Right, no, it's just I know, here. but it was just at that time, the only one time. It was the only one time. Well, then, then why did Gabriel say that you know the the dog in his in in Muhammad's house was hindering his prayers? No, of course. Like I'm telling you, every religion, every thought, every society have their own thought about about different animals. Like Muslims are not eating pork. Jewish are not eating pork, mm-hmm. but the Christians are eating. Mm-hmm. Even it's not allowed in uh, Christianity. If, if we go to the Bible, to the Old Testament, you will find that it's not allowed. But why they are using it? Because it's it's the people's thought. Mirway, thank you for calling in. Yeah, you're I, welcome. Thank I, I, you. I, I, yeah, good nice I, to, talk to, uh, to talk to you. And if you give me uh, some time, I will, I will m- make more well, explanation I, about I, this. I can't right now, Mirway, because i got to go to commercial break. And when we come back... Andy Bannister has a Ph.D. in Islamic studies. He's one of the speakers at Dig and Delve. And uh, I don't know, maybe we'll talk about dogs when he comes on. I don't know. We'll see, you know. Stay with us. I'm sure it's going to be interesting. A whole new take on the stories of the day. Late Night Council on 580 CFRA. Welcome back to the show. Joining us. Uh, from Toronto, uh, Dr. Andy Bannister, who has his doctorate is in Islamic studies. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Bannister, I'm going to I'm going to assume y- y- you're uh, uh, approaching, you know, Quranic uh, uh, studies from a, from a Christian perspective. Is that a right assumption? Well, y- yes. and No. I mean, in the Ph.D. work that I, that I did, I went through a secular uh, university. So Wh- I which just, university I went through a university called Brunel University that's in uh, England. And so just took a sort of fairly standard academic approach to the Quran, but obviously I make no secret of the fact I'm a Christian as well. So, so you know, we just have a starting point. His latest book is An Oral Formulaic Study of the Quran. So uh, give us some of the big misconceptions and misunderstandings that Western culture has about the Quran. Okay, because we see it, you know, we hear of all these extremist jihadists, mm. And, uh, you know, we've got neighbors and friends who are described in the media as moderate Muslims who seem like wonderful people, you know, and they love their families and they do well here in right. Canada. And, 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 you know, we don't want to have that kind of attitude towards them. So uh, you're the Quranic expert here. What's, uh, uh, give us some misunderstandings here that, 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 that people in Western culture, you, if, yeah, you, exactly. if, you could tell every, no pressure, if you could tell every Canadian, what would you tell them? Uh, I would say two things. Number one, I think one of the huge problems that people have, mistakes that Westerners make when they approach the Quran, they assume it's like the Bible. They assume it's just the Islamic version of the Bible, but it's not. It's not. It's a hugely different document that you need to approach on its own merits, number one. Secondly, I think the reason we get ourselves in trouble with the Quran and with Muslims, there's, there tends to be this tendency to fall into one or two positions, either that we say that all Muslims are moderate and we just ignore the extremists or try and pigeonhole them, or you leap the other direction and you demonize or Muslims, you try and categorize Islam as being wholly peaceful or wholly, uh, wholly violent. And I think when you read the Quran, you discover the problem is it speaks with both voices. 
that's where the problem arises. If you are a moderate Muslim, there are texts that you can find in the Quran that you can appeal to. If you are a more jihadi orientated Muslim, there are texts that you can find in the Quran that you appeal to. So that raises the question of how you navigate the Quran, how you sort through that difference. Now, over 1400 years of tradition, Muslim scholarship and Muslim, uh, Muslim faith has generally evolved some ways of doing that. And one of the ways is that you read the Quran through the filter, through the lens of Muhammad's life. And the difficulty that we have is that Muhammad began effectively as a moderate at the first half of his career and then ended up in a slightly more um, robust and even violent place towards the end. And so I think it's probably easier in terms of the way the Quran has traditionally been understood to be a radical, quite frankly. But there are many, many, many moderate Muslims who want to find a moderate, peaceful Islam, who want to come to Canada, raise their kids, uh, you know, do the nine to five, just live peaceful, uh, tolerant, moderate lives. And some of them will go to the Quran to support that. Many of them, quite frankly, are moderate simply in spite of the Quran. Um, and I often say that most of the moderate Muslims I know, and I know many, and I've counted many as friends over the years, quite frankly, they are moderate in spite of Islam, not because of Islam. It's a fairly nominal form of Islam that they hold to. Does that help? Uh, I, I guess so. I asked for your opinion, and yours is far more educated than mine. Um, now, it, I have heard, you know, a, a theologian suggest that many, when, you know, Islam was first spreading in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 700 and 800 A.D., the common perception of Christianity, were not common, but there was a perception there that this was a revival movement out of that, that was that would that, that kind of uh, it was it was respected as a, as a revival movement that was in harmony with Christianity. Was that ever the case? And then there was a, a few, you know, theologians in 700 and 800 AD that denounced it. And that became, you know, kind of the the the, the mood and the opinion of widespread Christendom, you know, uh, mm. since then. It, it, was that true? Was there no, I, I, was I there was there so. ever I, harmony I between the two? trying to advance that claim. I don't think you can advance that claim either historically or interestingly from inside Islam. I think it's very interesting that if you read the Quran and you read through the life of Muhammad, seeing how he interacted with Christians and uh, more so with Judaism, but with both Jews and Christians, when he first begins his career in, in Mecca in the early 600s, you get this sense that Muhammad thought that he would be welcomed and embraced by Jews and Christians who would simply see him as, as one of them, as a revival movement. That didn't happen. Jews and Christians reacted against them and said, no, this is not a message like the message of the Bible. You are not like Moses. You are not like Jesus. And then his language, Muhammad's own language in the Quran towards the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, gets harsher as you go chronologically through the Quran. And this great rift develops between Islam and Judaism and Islam and Christianity. And, and the Quran repudiates Christianity. I would say on all of the main things that I believe as a Christian, the Quran teaches uh, not just something different, often the precise opposite. The most famous example in the fourth chapter, verse 157 of the Quran, it denies that Jesus was even crucified. And that the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection are the central claim of Christianity. Now, when Islam bursts out of, of Arabia and begins its empire building following the death of Muhammad in 632 AD, many former Christian countries fall under uh, under the heel of Islam, as Islam expands along North Africa and up into Europe. And we can go back and look historically at what the people who were conquered were saying about those who were conquering them, and they didn't see it as a, as a revival movement. There are questions about how they, how they did see it. I think that some historians have raised some interesting questions about how unified Islam was at the start. Many of those conquered peoples just saw it as another oppressive empire coming in over the horizon. They didn't view it theologically. But the idea that uh, early on people saw Islam as just a variant of, of Christianity, I, I don't think you can support that historically, and I don't think you can support that from within the Quran and the way that Islam saw itself. Now, we've got, we've got about uh, 60 seconds here before we've got to go to the news, so you've got to Excellent. answer this one pretty quick. I will do my best. Uh, one of the problems that, you know, there seems to be no central authority within Islam. There are there are Sunnis, there are Shiites, yeah. those are the two main divisions, and then there's a few more, you know, popular uh, offshoots. Who speaks for Islam? There's no central. I guess it's it's whatever the local imam says. That's how the you know that's, people under his rule are going to yeah. live, right? You're absolutely right, John, and that's one of the problems. There is more of a central authority in Shiite Islam because it's been always constructed that way. But Sunni Islam, that's the mainstream, 80 percent of Muslims in the world, there is no central authority. What you have are different imams, different scholars, 
different power bases competing for authority. And we, we neglect as Westerners that Islam is very diverse and there are warring factions within Islam trying to be the top Well, I, I've made the statement from a political perspective that there's more Muslims that are killed by Islamic extremists than, you know, any other religious group in the world. Yeah. Because uh, when they yeah. when you differ with a certain interpretation of Islam, usually they go after the, you know, the, the, oh, the word, more yeah. apostate Muslims in their mind. Look at the Ahmadiyya in Pakistan and you see that. Yeah, yeah. More with Dr. Andy Bannister. His PhD is in Islamic studies and we're going to take some calls when we get back after the news on Ask the Pastor on Late Night Council. Stay with us. And uh, uh, Dr. Bannister, you ready to take a, a call or two here? Yeah, sounds okay, good. Okay, we're going we're gonna to bring uh, we're going to bring James in Ottawa. On. How you doing, James? Well, very well, thanks. I'm gr- I'm very glad to have this opportunity to ask a question um, to your guest. I just would though I'd like to just like add one last thing to this dog thing because it really took on a life of its own. If anybody really wants to know for themselves what the facts of that are, just do a Google search for mm-hmm. a blind person refused entry to Muslim taxi cab with, because he had a dog. And look at the number of hits you get from different countries. Well, you James, you yourself. sent me an email here, and there's, there's a, a, a news stories from the Israel, Israel National News, globalnews.ca, which is the Canadian global TV network, theblaze.com, and the Daily Mail of uh, London, and all of them are the same, that, that there's a taxi, uh, a Muslim taxi drivers and bus drivers who refuse uh, you know, uh, uh, guide dogs to come. And these are newspaper stories. Now, people can call in and say they're biased or whatever, but there they are. Those are respectable journals. Every one <laughs> these are vested dogs, too. These are dogs that, that they, it is illegal to refuse them entry because they're, they're dogs that have vests that have been through all kinds of varied. And I'm, I'm, I'm oh, I know. We've got guy, I've, we've had, I've had guide dogs in my church for years. Yes. So that pretty well, that should really solve the issue for anybody. Now, the question is: your your guest mentioned that the Quran. He saw, I'm going to phrase it a little differently than he did, but is basically two books: Mecca and Medina. And Mecca, which is the the the, the verses that were recited <laughs> earlier, were based basically roughly plagiarisms of of Jewish and Christian scripture. Uh, and that they were more or less nice and neighborly. And then, uh, as he became militarily powerful and took over the city of Yathrib, which we now call Medina, the verses became increasingly militant, violent, and instructions and uh, perpetual commands to violence. Now, I think that's basic. I'm rephrasing what your guest said, but your guest, I, I, your guest didn't mention something which I assume to be axiomatic, and that is a concept called abrogation, mm. which is in Quran itself which specifically says that any verse... Now, the Quran is not written in chronological order, or it was written in it, but it's not assembled in it. It was assembled in, in, in terms of chapter lengths. So in order to understand it, you have to know which verse was recited before or after another one. Now, abrogation says that the later verse, whichever was said next, abrogates or negates or replaces whatever was said earlier on the same subject. So if something nice was said in, you know, in, the, in the Mecca stage of, of Quran... Later on, an instruction was, no, actually what you've got to do is kill them wherever you see them. Later on, that is under, now it says in the Quran, I'm, like, I'm not making this up, it actually explains in the Quran itself that later verses abrogate earlier verses. Now, the reason, the question is, wouldn't this actually eliminate the concept of the possibility of a moderate Islam? Not of moderate Muslims, of course, very likely the majority of Muslims don't you know, want to follow they don't want to behave in the way that, that Mohammed and his initial army did. But, but it, it is the religion itself. It seems to me that the Islamic State, as we see it in the Middle East, and uh, uh, the Taliban and, and the Saudis and so on, are basically uh, following exactly what Islam really is, according to the, the, based on the idea of abrogation. Abrogation, Dr. Bannister, explain. Yeah, I'm glad, James, hi. I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you brought that up and filled in what I'd said. I mean, absolutely, abrogation is clearly there in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 106 is the verse that's classically appealed to, and you're, you're absolutely right that the moderate verses tend to be the, the earlier ones, the more violent ones tend to be the later ones, so well, perhaps the most violent verse in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 5, known as the sword verse, is commonly thought to have abrogated up to 124 peaceful verses. So that really only leaves you a number of choices as a moderate Muslim. I mean, I think, as I said, to, as I said earlier to John, I mean, thankfully, Millions upon millions upon millions of, of our Muslim friends are moderate. Most people who have Muslim neighbors and friends and colleagues, they're going to be moderate. But they're moderate really for a number of reasons, largely because they haven't read the Quran. They haven't, um, they haven't read the life of Muhammad. They haven't read the Sirah and, and the Hadith, his biography. Uh, or in a few cases, 
you meet those who have really dug into these things, realize there's a problem, and then try to re-engineer 1,400 years of Islamic tradition. There are ways that you can do that, but you have to overturn 1,400 years of tradition. I have encountered moderates who will try and wrestle with chapter 2, verse 106 of the Quran, because in the, in the case of the doctrine of abrogation, there are debates around what abrogates what. But largely, I, I agree with you. The basic problem we have is that the Quran has been read through the filter of the life of Muhammad, and Muhammad ends up in political power using religion as a, as a weapon. And whenever religion and politics get together, it goes very badly wrong. And it did in early Islam, and, uh, and that's left its imprint on, uh, on Islam. So I tend to say, if I'm going to be my most controversial, the problem is not so much the Quran, the problem is more Muhammad, who is the filter through which the Quran is usually read. So yeah, I largely, I largely agree with you. Thank you for bringing abrogation up. That's, that's uh, so D- Dr. Bannister, is there, would you say within Islam, there are those that are trying to reform it? Yes. There, there are. There are. And I know, and I know many of them. The, the challenge is a number of things. The challenge is overturning, overturning the weight and momentum of 1,400 years of tradition. It's not impossible. But one of the things you asked me earlier um, about the question of you know, how Westerners sometimes misunderstand Islam, one of the common misconceptions I sometimes hear is people will say, well, perhaps Islam needs a reformation, like Christianity had a reformation. Well, the problem is in Christianity, the Reformation was back to the sources. That was the cry of Luther and Calvin. We need to go back to scripture, back to tradition. Whereas those who are calling for reform in Islam are really calling to say, well, let's get away from tradition. Let's try and you know, rework the way it's been, it's been thought. So there are those. I, I know Muslims who have, who have very bravely taken a stand against radicalism. I have Muslim friends who've had death threats from those who are at the ultra-radical end for the stance that they've taken. Um, the question is whether, whether it's possible and what that would look like. Of course, one way you can do that is you go the mystical route, like the Sufis have gone, and you try and interpret everything as, as allegory. That's one possible route, but they've always traditionally been a very small minority uh, group in Islam. So I think there's a battle going on for the, for the heart of the soul of Islam. And... Um, there's a lot of work to be done if it's going to be a moderate Islam that wins out. Thank you, James. Oh, actually, oh sorry, James. Can I ask a question about yeah, that? Then? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm. Because, see, first of all, I would, I would, I, I agree with almost everything, but from what I, what little I know about it, but except that I would, I would refer to the groups he was referring to. You have cultural Muslims, which mm-hmm. were the ones that haven't read that stuff and view themselves as Muslims because their heritage is such, and there's never an issue with those guys. And then there's the religious ones, and of course, yes, we, I would say even the Islamic State that we see today is the reformation of Islam mm. because it's bringing it away from the more liberal version that was sort of imposed on Islam by colonial period, where the, the British and other colonial powers went over to the Middle East and North Africa and stopped slavery and stopped some of the more barbaric practices. And I think I can say that now that the government's made it official. And then, um, so we, we've, I think, you know, we've seen that. But, but in terms of reforming it, there are certainly those a few within it that want to create a new kind. But in the Koran itself, it's pretty clear. I forget what page. I haven't memorized it, but I remember reading it. I remember reading it said specifically that this cannot be modified. It can't be reformed. It can't be changed. I mean, it's immutable, and it's for all times. So I think it's actually page one. So that's the first problem that people within the faith want to have. And then outside the faith is what I find more interesting. And I think governments around the world and throughout history have seemed to me, now this is just observing geopolitics, but governments, especially Russia, has, have been trying to force and invented a new kind of Islam. And, and like 80 imams disappeared from the Crimea just two weeks ago. And at the same time as the, the Russian government announced that, that all certain uh, Islamic literature would have to disappear from the Crimea, or presumably several hundred imams more would disappear. So the, but this isn't new. The Russians are doing this for a long time, and it, it always fails. Because sooner or later, people find the original material, and they look at it and go, that's not what it is. So how, like, what would a better strategy be? And I'll, I'll listen to the answer off air. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank what you, a James. great show this has been. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. Go ahead, Eddie. I, just, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, just thanking James for his... His comment there, I mean, really, I wish I had the answer. I, I wish I had the answer to what it would look like. The, interesting, the one thing I would add to what, he, what James said there about, Western, about governments and, and geopolitics, one of, the, one of the things 
I don't often despair. I'm, I'm British. I like to think I'm optimistic, not pessimistic, but there we go. The one, the one thing I do sometimes worry about in our Western responses from Western governments to what's going on in, in much of the Middle East, I think we've forgotten, our Western politicians and journalists have often forgotten that theology is actually an important category. And we bought into what's been known by, what's been termed by some scholars to be the Marxist theory of religion that says religion is really all about, is really all about economics. And you don't need to worry about theology, but theology matters. It really does matter. It matters in Iran because that's the, Iran. that's the driving the force. Well. That's the driving force of the decisions that they're making all the time there. It does. It does. And to be, you know, you could push it further and say it, it, and it matters in terms of um, other religious systems such as atheism and communism that mm-hmm. are effectively religious systems. They affect how people think and they affect how choices are made. And I think, well, I really hope and pray that our Western leaders kind of wake up and go, we need to re-engage and begin to learn to think theologically. It doesn't mean you have to agree with the system, but to at least understand how it works. I get nervous when I hear people say that ISIS are lunatics. They're not. There's a cold, hard logic there, which I wholly disagree with, but there's an internal logic there. And unless you understand it and can deconstruct it and repudiate it, and we that's are who they trouble. are, and that's who drives the, what drives them as well. That's right. Dr. Bannister is going to be one of the uh, speakers speaking at Dig and Delve. Go to digandelve.ca if you want to find out about that. It's this Friday and Saturday at the Ottawa.